The Schrodinger equation is probably the most important equation in the theory of quantum physics, but its derivation, where the equation actually comes from, is not something that's talked about enough in my opinion. Some people even reckon that this equation can't be derived. So in this video we'll look at a somewhat intuitive derivation of the Schrodinger equation step by step, and hopefully it will convince you that physicists haven't just pulled this out of thin air. Hi there, my name's Bart, and I make fun physics videos on this channel. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more content just like this. Okay, now before we take a look at this intuitive derivation of the Schrodinger equation, I should quickly mention a couple of things. One, this derivation isn't exactly the same as the one that Schrodinger himself used when he came up with his equation for the first time. His derivation is very clever, and uses parallels between different areas of physics, as well as the principle of conservation of energy, but it's slightly different, and I think slightly harder to follow than the one we'll be talking about in this video. If you'd like me to make a video about Schrodinger's derivation, then please do let me know in the comments. And two, the derivation we'll be talking about today, I found in a very interesting paper by David W. Ward of Harvard and Sabine Volkmer of MIT. I'll link the paper in the description. I highly recommend you check it out if you want a detailed understanding of what's going on. Okay, so let's get into it. In order to derive our Schrodinger equation, we're actually going to start with another equation from the world of classical physics. This is the electromagnetic wave equation. As you can guess from its name, it describes how electromagnetic waves, such as light, x-rays, radio waves, and more, behave within our universe. For the purposes of this video, we don't need to understand this equation in a great amount of detail. If you do want to learn more about this equation, then check out this video I made a while ago, which I'll also link in the description. What we do need to know, though, is a specific solution of the equation. The solution looks like this. Now it looks quite mathsy, so let's take a look at a few important features of it. First things first, this solution looks at how the electric field changes over space and time in order for a wave to exist in that region of space and time. In particular, the value of the electric field fluctuates regularly between some specific value e subscript naught and then zero, and then negative e subscript naught and then zero again. Now, we've got some constant in our solution too, but these don't matter too much for our video, and we've done a bit of hand-waving and written this solution in terms of both the momentum and the energy of the photons, which are particles of light that correspond to the electromagnetic waves that we're studying wave-particle duality and all that. If you want a full description of why we've written our equation in terms of momentum and energy, rather than the more usual wave number and angular frequency, which you may be expecting if you're already familiar with EM waves, then do check out the paper linked in the description. But basically, the wave that we're studying looks like a sine curve in shape. This means that for a particular point in time, like we've got this snapshot of the wave here, as we move through space in the x direction, the value of the electric field oscillates like a sine curve between e naught and then zero and then minus e naught and then back to zero again and so on. Now the wave also travels through space as time passes, which means that if we instead focus on one point in space, and look at how its E field value changes over time, which is the reverse of what we were doing earlier, then we also see that the value of the electric field goes from E naught to zero to negative E naught to zero again, and so on. This solution, like I said, is one example of a wave that is allowed to exist since it is a valid solution of the wave equation, which generically describes all the kinds of waves that are allowed to exist. The solution we've looked at is an important one, since a lot of our mathematical understanding of waves has these types of sinusoidal waves as building blocks. As these waves move through space and time, they transfer energy from one place to another. Now, I've told you that this wave here is a solution to the wave equation, but let's actually confirm that. What we can do is to substitute this solution into our wave equation and see what that gives us. So every time we see the electric field E in our equation, we replace it with our solution. Then we take the partial derivatives. If you know calculus, then feel free to pause the video and have a go at that. Basically, we just do the maths that the equation is asking us to do. When we do this, what we find in reality is that our solution is only a solution if this relationship is satisfied. The square of the energy of a photon associated with our EM wave is equal to the square of the photon's momentum multiplied by the square of its speed, c. Some of us may already be familiar with the famous constant c, the speed of light. 
So if our EM waves are to be allowed solutions to our wave equation, then their corresponding photons will have to follow this kind of relationship. And they do. In fact, this is the defining relationship between a photon's energy and its momentum. Now, there's a reason why I haven't taken the square root off this relationship and simplified it. And the reason is because in this form, we can clearly see that this is the relationship between energy and momentum for any object without mass, which is exactly what photons are. The full version of this energy-mass relationship looks like this. This is known as the mass-energy equivalence relation, and it's from this equation that we get Einstein's famous E is equal to mc squared equation when we're studying objects that do have mass, but no momentum, meaning that they're not moving. And similarly, we've seen the other side of the incomplete picture as well, the relationship between the energy and momentum for objects that do have momentum, but no mass, like photons. Both of these relationships, as we've seen, are two parts of a bigger, more general relationship, this one. So let's take a moment to think about what we've done so far. We started with a wave equation that describes electromagnetic waves and found a common solution for it. We then realized that this solution is only truly a solution if this relationship holds. And this relationship does hold for photons, which can have momentum, but they don't have mass. This relationship here is also part of a bigger picture, which is the mass-energy equivalence relation that should apply to everything across the universe. So what if we now choose to go the other way, but with a different relationship? What if we now insisted that the relationship that must hold must be the one for any object that has mass and possibly some momentum as well? In other words, we're insisting that the relationship that must hold true must be the full mass-energy equivalence relation. What would our wave equation have to look like if it were to describe objects with mass rather than electromagnetic waves? Well, it would have to look like this. This equation is known as the Klein-Gordon equation. And as we hoped for, it's used to describe particles that have mass and are also free to move, meaning they can have momentum. Now, the interesting thing about the Klein-Gordon equation is that it accounts for particles that behave relativistically. What this means is that any particles moving at high speeds will experience somewhat unintuitive effects that are explained by the theory of relativity. In fact, I recently made a video explaining why the Schrodinger equation failed at dealing with relativity, and why we need to upgrade to the Klein-Gordon and Dirac equations. Check it out up here, also linked in the description. But what we're trying to do here is get to the Schrodinger equation. So what we then need to do is to reduce the Klein-Gordon equation down into non-relativistic scenarios. Relativistic effects become noticeable when we're studying objects moving at high speeds, as we've just said. So we can choose to restrict the equation to low speeds, where relativity won't bother us. We do this by realizing that the speed of any particle we study, v, will be much smaller than c, the speed of light. So therefore, mv, which is its momentum, will be much smaller than mc. The exact mathematical details aren't super important, but when we sub in this information and do all the maths, we're left with, drumroll please, the Schrodinger equation. Now, I think that this derivation that we've looked at is fairly intuitive, because if we understand the maths, then we can follow it step by step. But even if we aren't familiar with all the mathematics, we can still follow all the logical steps. We began with the classical wave equation, one that has been around for many years before quantum mechanics was even a thing. We realized that electromagnetic waves were described by this equation and saw a particular solution, as well as a relationship that needed to be met if that solution was to genuinely be a true solution of the wave equation. Then we realized that this relationship just described how the momentum of photons related to their energy. We instead swapped this with a similar relationship that applied to objects with mass and worked backwards to a modified wave equation. This new modified wave equation no longer worked on electromagnetic waves, but rather on wave functions of particles with mass. But since this equation accounted for relativistic effects, we reduced it down to non-relativistic scenarios and ended up with the Schrodinger equation. And this shows us that the Schrodinger equation need not have come out of thin air. Of course, experimentally, the Schrodinger equation is well tested and verified. Its predictions very closely match what we expect to see happening in real life. But even theoretically, there are a few ways to get the Schrodinger equation, and we've seen one of them today that I found particularly interesting. 
And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Please also check out my merch linked in the description. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And lastly, a huge thanks to all of the Giga patrons and all the others over on my Patreon page. If you'd like to support me on there, then that's also linked in the description. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you very soon.